Good afternoon. Come on, come on, it's snowing out, but you can do better. Good afternoon. Nice to see you all. Welcome to the Dean's Innovative Leader Series. Today, we are especially honored to welcome back to MIT, to MIT Sloan, one of our most distinguished and prominent alums. Eileen Gordon is President, CEO, and Chairman of Ingredient Incorporated. This Fortune 500 firm uh, has over 11,000 employees, over $6.5 billion in revenue, and operates in 40 countries. Um, Eileen's uh, leadership uh, since May 2009 has took this company in some extraordinarily positive and successful directions for which she's been recognized. Uh, she's listed, as you would guess, uh, as uh, Fortune Magazine's uh, top 50 women in uh, business in the world. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the character and the compass uh, that take you to that point, uh, Eileen showed early on. Uh, at a time in high school uh, when you know other uh, women of her time were taking shot, uh, were taking home economics, uh, she got the principal's approval to take shop instead. In high school, she was the only woman in her physics class, the only woman. She came to MIT, graduating in 1975 with a bachelor's degree in the easy subject of mathematics and was, as a woman at MIT, in a situation where the number of men outnumbered the number of women 18 to 1 during those years. Then in 1976, Eileen graduated from MIT's Sloan School of Management with the tough degree that we used to offer at that time, the Master of Science when you would do a thesis, and marched down the aisle with 19 women co-graduates, uh, 20 women graduating from MIT Sloan at that time. She went to work for Boston Consulting Group uh, for about four years, and then entered the packaging business, acquiring expanded responsibility through multiple firms, uh, coming to a place where she uh, led Rio Tinto Alcatel, and then, uh, sorry, Alcan. And then in May 2009, uh, had the opportunity to lead what was at the time uh, corn products. Uh, her uh, uh, challenge uh, in uh, growing uh, and in some ways reinventing that firm, I know is a topic that she looks forward to chatting with you about, uh, but through an extraordinarily large and successful merger, through a renaming and rebranding of this firm, and through its expansion and growing prominence globally, uh, Eileen is not just one of the Fortune magazine top 50 women executives in the world, but as you look at executives over the last four or five years who have been the most prominent and most lauded for their strategic direction, it is Eileen's, Eileen Gordon's name that comes to the top. Please, a warm welcome for Eileen Gordon. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, it's always great to be here, uh, come back to MIT, and I'll talk a little bit about my background and the journey um, that I really embarked on to get where I am today. Um, I'm a Bostonian by birth, but I got to tell you, I don't really have a strong Boston accent. But probably by the time I leave here, I will. And uh, I'm going to talk a lot about planning. And you know, when I uh, was invited to come here, I picked a date. And it actually was for last week. And I said to myself, you know, February, there's a lot of snow in Boston. I'm going to be smart and move it to March <laughs> and uh, avoid that. Um, but you know, the best plans, you always have to have a backup plan. And so I'll talk a lot about that. But again, very happy to be here. Um, you know, when you talk about the ratio of 18 to 1, uh, it does sound like an unreal world. Um, but it, it was the reality. And I'm very happy to hear that. That's changed at both MIT undergrad with 50% women and 40% at, at Sloan. Um, so again, to see such a diverse audience uh, in diversity to me isn't just gender, but it's cultural and multicultural. It's very, very exciting and very rewarding. So I'm going to speak for about, I don't know, 35, 40 minutes, and then I'm actually open to questions. And so please uh, think about those as we go through uh, the story. And I'm going to talk about 
our story at Ingredion and how we've transformed the company. And then I'll go back and talk a little bit about my career and journey and leadership lessons that I learned and that uh, I'm happy to share with you. So our company, Ingredion, and again, many of you may know the old name, Corn Products. In fact, we were part of CPC in New Jersey, if you go back about 15, 20 years. Uh, but again, we, we're a global company. We provide ingredient solutions. We're very diversified around the world. Um, uh, again, as the dean said, 40 countries. Um, manufacturing all over the world. So I spend a lot of my time on airplanes. I think I was in South America a week ago. And uh, actually, it was summer there, so very different. Um, our global R&D facility, and I'm going to talk about innovation and in R&D that we acquired is in Bridgewater, New Jersey. It happens to be just down the street from Princeton, so we have a lot of smart people there. We're headquartered um, right outside of Chicago. Uh, really, Westchester is next to Oak Brook, so you've all, we're 15 minutes from the airport, so Chicago's a great global city to travel the world. Uh, 11,000 employees, and last year we were six and a half billion, and we reached the Fortune 500 number 390. My analytical mind, I'm actually trying to figure out what number we're going to be when they publish the list in about a month. But uh, I don't have the whole database. But uh, I think we're going to go up in the, in the scale. And again, this company has a very strong balance sheet, um, great cash flow. And so everybody's asking me, what's the next chapter? You know, we have a very simple uh, business model. And a lot of people try to build their business model and be very complicated. Uh, but uh, when you think about our business model, we buy raw materials, mainly corn, but we process uh, tapioca, which, is, which grows in Colombia and, and uh, Thailand. We process potato and rice, and they all have different features and attributes, so the scientists in, you, in the audience will, will know about the different enzymes. And we basically process that corn in a wet uh, process with enzymes. And the output is what's called a starch slurry. And then there are some co-products that go to feed animals. And the starch slurry, we have lots of choices and where we want that to go. And so we actually can make sweeteners for soft drinks or for baked goods. We can actually um, make beer. We, so we do high maltose corn syrup for the brewery industry, which is why South America is so exciting. We actually can take that starch and make yogurt very creamy or crunchy. Uh, and so again, we make food taste good, and we make food, we get great textures and the different sweetness. So we have to, we work on those different choices and functionality. So the food business is a great business because we pass on those corn prices to all of our customers. Uh, and that's why food prices might be going up, but we actually pass that on in our business model. And then we have many choices. So if people want healthy food, we're working on prebiotics. If people want a little bit of uh, an indulgence in yogurt or in a, a soft drink, we also produce ingredients. So we don't worry that much about a recession, which is, again, that's a people always have to eat. And there's more and more people in the world who, to feed. So if you think about the breakout of our business, again, 44% goes to the food industry. Beverage is 15. Brewing is 9. So those three together are the bulk. We also supply some ingredients for industrial and actually uh, we'll talk a little bit later about sustainability and green solutions, because a lot of packaging now is corn-based, which makes it biodegradable, which gives us a great entry to be a sustainable company. Now, if you think about um, when I came into the company, it's been almost four years. And I came into a situation, and you always have to think about where you have the opportunity to make a difference. The CEO of Corn Products had announced his retirement. Uh, Corn Products was supposed to be acquired by Bungie, a major agricultural company, but because of the financial crisis, so think back to September of 2008, it was a stock deal, financial crisis, the whole thing fell apart, it never happened. So suddenly you have a company where the CEO is retiring, the deal didn't happen, the strategy needed refreshing, the strategy was to be acquired, so what's the strategy going forward? And um, again, the company had strong regional brands, uh, regional businesses around the world. We've been in, we've been in uh, uh, South America for 100 years. We actually have a very good business in Pakistan. We've been in China and Korea. But again, no direction. And there was no global coordination. This was a company that was very international, but didn't have global expertise to share best practices or even global R&D. So I came into the situation, and they hired me in. And 
I came into a company that had, again, strong regional brands, I don't know, 10, 12 different names. And you have to say to yourself, what is the message of the company? And again, the global coordination. So when I went to South America, they said, our name is, we're CP Ingrediente. And they're very proud in Mexico of that name. Raftan Maze was the Pakistan name. And I was trying to figure out, well, so what, what is this company? What's our message? And we'll talk about the story of buying, about buying national starch and about what branding has done for our company. So I come into the company, and we basically have to put together a strategy. And so I worked with my team. We actually had a, a small boutique consulting firm. I had a BCG background, so I knew about strategy. And we put together our strategy, and I'm going to show you our strategic blueprint in a moment. But basically, we said we need an umbrella brand for our company. And we laid out strategic blueprint. We needed one voice. And frankly, our customers were very confused. Who is this company? Are they corn products? Are they CP Ingrediente? So we put together a strategy to grow our company and to be one brand. So we'll tell the story about becoming Ingredion. We had to actually change the symbol. And the old symbol where New York Stock Exchange was CPO. Well, I can tell you the day we changed the name, which was June 4th of last year, the stock stopped trading very, with a lot of velocity. I got very worried for about an hour. And somebody else had the INGR many years ago. And so another na company's name was showing up. And so we went through all those glitches. And, and finally, by the end of the day, got it straight. But the INGR symbol worked well. And it really reflects our business model. We're an ingredient company. And the problem with corn products is we're not a corn company. We buy corn. People used to say to me, oh, are you, are you a farmer? I'm like, no, no, no. We buy corn. We process it. Uh, and so the name Ingredion is an ingredient company. And ION signifies motion was a much better name for the company. But the strategy didn't change. So we um, basically had to put together our plan. And you know what's interesting is I think back to when I was at Sloan. Okay, So we're going back to the 70s. And I took a lot of courses on planning operational planning and strategic planning. And it, to, to this day, it's really served me well. Because I tell everybody, you know, what are the keys to success? And I say, you got to have the plan. And my professors were right. And if you don't have the plan, you can't get there. But the plan is not enough. And so a lot of you will, you may leave here and go into strategic planning. You may go into uh, strategy consulting. You got to have the plan. but. What's key is measuring performance, and it's all about the people. So I always said it's interesting. The strategy is, is challenging, but if you don't have the people to execute it, you have nothing. And that's really what separates good and bad companies is really the people. So when you think about our strategy, uh, we put together a strategic blueprint. And this strategic blueprint was presented to our analysts about, um, it was in uh, 2010. And basically, what we said to our shareholders and to the analysts is operating excellence is going to be fundamental to our company. And that's all about having good safety, because I, I'm a big proponent of safety. And, and if you don't have a safe plant, you don't have a well-run plant. And we now have made incredible progress. And we're, we're almost world class in safety in terms of accidents um, with and without lost time. And in capital intensive industries, that's extremely important. And we tell people, we want you to go home the same way you came to work, and that means a lot. But operating excellence is all about safety. It's about quality. It's about uh, exchanging best practices, Six Sigma having low costs. That's a fundamental today. You know, Everybody has to have it. It doesn't differentiate you, only if you don't have it. But how are you going to grow your company? I mean, every analyst, every investor, you know, even though we've doubled the stock price, all they want to know from me is, well, how are you going to double it again? You know, I was a hero yesterday, but I won't be tomorrow unless we figure out ways to grow the company. And there's three ways that we say we're going to grow our company. We're going to grow organically, and I'll talk about that. We can broaden our portfolio, so we're a, street, a sweetener and a texture expert. Should we broaden it with other ingredients? And then geographically, and there are some pockets where we can grow geographically. We're in China, but it's a big country. Uh, we're in Thailand. We're looking at India. We're the, we're the leader in South America, but there are some opportunities there. Mexico, we're a leader. So there are some opportunities. And it's all about creating shareholder value. So people ask me how I spend my time. 
I wake up every day and I think, how am I going to create shareholder value? How do you do that through your people? So, um, you know, a lot of people talk about having the plan, and we've laid out that type of strategy, and that's our blueprint that hasn't changed. And a lot of people talk about financial performance, but unless you measure operational performance, you're not going to get the financial performance. And so we have KPIs, you know, key performance indicators, metrics. And everyone on my team, my direct reports, has five goals. And I ask them, what are you going to measure? What are we going to measure to know that we're making progress? So the Human Resource Department, one of their measurements is percent of um, voluntary turnover and involuntary turnover. It's a simple metric, but it tells you are you promoting people? Are you retaining people? And are the right people staying and the right people leaving? So we have operational metrics. Uh, and you don't want 100 of them, because some companies, you know, you go to General Motors, they have like 100 metrics. And uh, you got to focus on the ones that really make the difference. And it will lead to successful financial performance. Uh, but having that system is very important. So you got to have the plan. you got to measure your performance. And then. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about it's all about the people. And so we tell people that our mission is to be a, a leading global ingredient solution provider. So we wake up every day and we think about our customers. And it's all the major food companies, you know, Unilever, Nestle, people that you're probably, you could be working for. And we'll be supplying solutions to make those food companies successful. And we'll talk about some of those consumer trends. But it's all about the changing trends. And consumers, as you read about food companies, there are consumers who want high calorie soft drinks. And there are consumers who want zero calories. And there are consumers who want healthy yogurt. And we provide ingredients for all of that. And so it's very important to look at those trends. People want healthier food. People want low calorie. People want convenience. So our ingredients have to help food companies um, have a, a lunch that they could eat in their car or something they can put back in the refrigerator. Or in the UK, we supply ingredients for Marks and Spencer ready meals where people don't go to a restaurant, they leave their office, they get restaurant ready food and they take it home and they have, uh, they have meals for one and they go home and people then watch TV and do work. But our ingredients make that taste very good. We're also looking at bolt-on acquisitions and so we'll talk about the, a major acquisition that we did but now it's all about bolt-on acquisition, and it's all about customer collaboration. So these are the three things that we're thinking about all, at all points in time. So our company, in terms of an acquisition, um, when I came into the company, we were $3.9 billion. And when you think about that strategic blueprint, we had to figure out a way to broaden our portfolio and expand geographically. And there was a company called National Starch, Way back, it had been part of Unilever. The company was a billion three. It had been owned by ICI, and ICI was bought by Axo Nobel. In fact, Axo Nobel had tried to sell the company before I came in, and they wanted $2 billion for it. And nobody was buying it. It was the financial crisis. So they held on to it. And uh, Axo Nobel was getting kind of anxious to sell it, but it wasn't on the market. So I actually called up Axo Nobel and said, gee, we'd be interested in looking at the business. They were a perfect fit. Uh, they were, um, I actually wanted to do bolt-ons. That was my plan A. But plan B was this large acquisition. In fact, I told the analysts, we're going to do bolt-ons, and we're going to spend 400 to $900 million. Well, this was, a, this was in one flow swoop where I could change the culture. So we paid a billion three for this company and spent all the money at once, and it was a great fit. We got a great price. So we paid a billion three. Axon Nobel was holding out for $2 billion earlier, so our timing was great. Um, we knew we could integrate it well. We had put in SAP, you know, all this technology. You have to have enablers because you have to, to integrate something like this very quickly. You need to have those systems and processes. And we had competitors, actually, who were, had also called Axon Nobel and were negotiating at the same time. And I knew there might be competitors. I wasn't sure we were competing with ourselves. Axon Nobel, in fact, I offered them a billion dollars, and they said, more, more. And at one point, I walked away from the table, and I said, I'm not giving you any more. And then the bankers tried to pull me back and said, OK, what's 100 million? You know, it's, uh, 
In fact, my board was very helpful because, you know, they said to me, in the scheme of things, 100 million over 20 years, if it creates the right value, you know, it's, it, you shouldn't walk away from it. So you get advice from different people. So we um, ended up agreeing to pay the billion three and announced it on June 21st, 2010. And I had a competitor who actually was going to announce the deal the next day. And so, you know, you say, well, how can they be negotiating with two people? They were. And they had different rooms and different hotels. And, the, and whoever got there to the finish line first was going to win. And we also had an advantage. We didn't have any antitrust issues. We weren't in Europe. Uh, CPC had exited Europe. And one of my competitors might have had some antitrust challenges. So in the middle of the night, my team signed the deal, flew back to the US. They had been in Amsterdam. And we announced the deal. And you know, it was hailed as one of the uh, most incredible deals because we ended up paying about six EBITDA. Um, and again, uh, got 50 million of synergies and created a whole new culture. And you know, a lot of acquisitions fail, and they fail because of the people. And so I'm going to talk, tell you about the people side and why this one went so well. But it was very complimentary. They were a starch specialist. We were a sweetener specialist. We had strength in South America and the US. They had strength in Europe and Asia. And by putting it together again, we became a, a perfect fit. And, and the most important thing, and I think this group will be particularly interested, is um, corn products didn't have a lot of R&D. Um, they had eliminated it when people were cutting things. But to be a successful provider of ingredient solutions to companies today, you have to have R&D capabilities to create those new solutions. And National Starch was the leader in product development. So we ended up buying, um, in this Bridgewater, New Jersey, an R&D center. And there were 140 scientists there, a lot of PhDs. And um, you know, incredible labs. You know, we have focus groups. We have sensory labs. Um, we have test kitchens. So if you walk in there, there are people who are chefs working with customers. We actually have customers that can come in there, and they say, I want my yogurt to be creamy or crunchy. And we can design it on the spot and get it on the shelf and bring it to market in four months if that's what they want, or we can take longer. So it's to be that type of nimble and have that technology is important. So we acquired all this, but all these people were in Bridgewater, New Jersey, and I wanted them to feel that they were part of this new company. Um, so when you think about the, um, the, the R&D process, and I know you probably have courses on innovation, um, but from a practical point of view, we use this funnel. Now, it looks pretty basic, but basically, in any R&D process, you got to start with the customer trends, the consumer trends. What do consumers want? They want healthier food. They want something that tastes good. Every food company will tell you they won't put any product on the, on the shelf that doesn't taste good. They, people want, of course, convenience, the aging of the population. We make products for the older generation that has trouble swallowing. Um, we actually make ingredients for infant formula because there's more babies, there's more old people, there's growth in China. And so again, uh, and, and the taste that people want is different around the world. So while we have this Bridgewater R&D facility, we actually have product development in Singapore, in Hamburg, um, in Mexico, in Brazil, um, and in the US because you have to adjust it to the local taste. So we look at all of those trends and then we came up with a couple of what I call marketing or research themes that I'll show you in a moment, focused on customer requirements and come up with ingredient solutions. And it's a disciplined process. So at any one point in time, we may have 100 projects. People say to me, well, do you want 300 projects? I say, no. I want you to kill projects that aren't meeting the, the, the stage gate. Because if they're not going to pay off, I'd rather spend time, those 140 scientists, that they spend time on more important projects. So R&D has to be a very disciplined process, whether you're spending $30 million or $100 million. And we came up with National Starch with six what I call research themes or six product market areas. And we staff each of these with a group of young product development people and marketing people. So as an example, we have a nutrition group. And we, have a, we call these springboards because they're springboards to growth. And we have a nutrition springboard leader. 
and what this person thinks about and develops with his team are what are the opportunities um, that will address the nutrition demands of consumers. And so is it something that is low calorie? Is it prebiotics? Is it something um, gluten free? A big trend. And we have products that we then develop with the R&D people that address that particular trend. And so we do that in each of these. Now Green Solutions is our newest one, our newest springboard, because this is all about having products that are sustainable and biodegradable. So as I said, corn is a great uh, input for packaging. And we're actually working on packaging trays that are biodegradable. And we sell those to some of our food companies. So it's some of the same customers and some of the same processing. Um, Wholesome is one of my favorite and growing very rapidly, where many of you from Europe will know that in Europe, consumers want their products to have what's called a clean label. They don't want anything processed. So on their product, it can say starch. If it says modified starch, they don't want it. They think it's modified. We have a patent on a product that uses heat to modify starch. Um, instead of enzymes, and it's used for these Marks and Spencer's ready meals. So it addresses this clean label. We produce it in Hamburg. We're adding capacity. It's growing very rapidly, even with a recession in, in Europe. But again, having the discipline of this process is very important. So um, that's all about the acquisition and technology and, all, and strategy. That's all very important. But without the people, as I said, and I think this is what you don't know necessarily when you're, you're studying um, how important it is. And so I'll give you an example. So the National Starch Acquisition, most, most of the times you hear, oh, my company's being acquired. I'm going to lose my job. And these were very talented people, and I didn't want to lose them. So the day we announced the acquisition, I called the CEO of the division, and I said, we're coming to have dinner with you and your entire team tomorrow night within 24 hours, because I want you to know how important you are. So I rented a plane and flew my whole team. And they all came in from around the world. And we had dinner that night. And we walked into the room. And this is a very you know, young, energetic group. And they were all a little bit nervous. And the first thing they said to me is, what's going to be our new name? The corn products people who'd been in the company 30 years didn't want to change the name. Their, their attitude was, well, we're 3.9 billion. They're a billion three. We'll call it corn products. But from the moment I walked in the room, I knew that would not be successful. Because National Starch had this R&D um, uh, value-added philosophy. And corn products was considered more basic uh, ingredients. And so at that moment, and they joked and they said, gee, corn products and National Starch, maybe our name should be corn starch. Well, <laughs> I nixed that right away. I mean, that was one of our 1,000 ingredients. And so what we did is we formed a team, a cross-functional team. It wasn't just marketing people. I had manufacturing. We had people from, from China. And they came up with the name Ingredion. And you, it, you know, at the beginning, some of the people had been in the, you know, Corn Products was a 100-year-old name, and so was National Starch. But when, we, when I said we're changing our name, and then people began to realize I was serious, uh, they finally got on board. I announced it a year ago. We changed it in June. And now I have 30-year people at Corn Products, who are, we have a big facility in South Chicago, and I was down there about a week ago, and the stock price, you know, has more than doubled since I joined. You know, their investment in the company is worth a lot more than they thought, and they're very excited, and they said, you did the right thing, changing the name to Ingredion, because now people want to join the company um, because it's, we're being innovative and proactive, and believe me, one of our competitors in Chicago is Groupon. And we're looking a lot better than Groupon these days. And, but you know, did you want to join Corn Products or Ingredion? So again, it was the right thing to do for our company. But again, it was all about the people, to get people excited and to combine the two companies. And I said, I don't want the Corn Products culture. I don't want the National Starch culture. I want the best of both. I want a new culture. So it's all about transformation. And the name was just the end of that process. And in fact, we created 50 million in synergies. And the entire National Starch team, uh, management team, stayed with us uh, for integration. And since then, I think we've only lost one person. So it was 14 people. And they all stayed through the acquisition. So 
you know, it's again, business transformation. Um, we basically, six and a half billion, we changed our name. I rang the New York Stock Exchange bell. You know, I thought that was a bit kind of hokey, but people in the company loved it. You know, the day that I rang the bell, this was June 15th, it just was symbolic for the next chapter, the new company. So uh, stock price, as I said, has more than doubled. This is my scorecard. Our market cap is over $5 billion. You know, the company only was on the Fortune 500 last year for the first time because we reached that mark uh, to be big enough. So again, people are very excited at my company, and we're all about the next chapter. So that's the story, and I'm happy to spend a few minutes just to tell you about the journey um, that, that the Dean mentioned a little bit, so I know people are always interested in careers. Um, most of you know, uh, grew up in this area, so it wasn't very far, but um, moved from Newton to Cambridge and joined MIT in, in 71 and ended up at, at Sloan in uh, 75, 76. And again, it, it was a great time to be in technology. Um, you know, I don't say I was a math major, I say course 18, so I never forget that. And course 15, too, so um, always remember that. And leaving, um, leaving Sloan, I got the opportunity to join Boston Consulting Group. And I started in the Boston office, but I, BCG was looking for people to move to Europe. So in the 70s, I raised my hand and I said, I'll go to Europe, I'll go to London. And so again, international experience is one of my messages to make sure you get that in as early as you can in your career because it really throws you into an environment where I didn't meet any professional women in the 70s, but I forged through and I convinced those European men uh, that I could add value as a young consultant. And it wasn't easy, uh, but again, it made me a much stronger person to do that. And then BCG, I met my husband there. We, they brought us back to open the Chicago office. And you know, I thought the Midwest, you know, what, you know, what, what's that? I mean, I was an East Coast person. I thought I'd be in Chicago two years. 34 years later, I'm still there. Um, two children that were born in Chicago, and sorry, but they're incredible Bears fans, you know. Um, uh, and uh, though when the Red Sox come to town, they say, uh, Mom, you know, are you gonna go see your team? So still they, they know that. Um, I, and, and so in consulting, I stayed in consulting four years. And you have to make a decision in consulting, and many of you will go into consulting, which is, do you, um, are you gonna be a consultant for your entire career, or are you gonna go to a company? And about four years is a good time to make that transition because you make a lot of money in consulting, you wanna be able to get that experience in operations. My husband stayed in consulting 35 years. Um, BCG, A.T. Kearney, Booz Allen, you know, he was with them all. And again, a life of travel, you know, 90% of the time. He just recently retired from that. But I wanted to implement strategy. And so I took that opportunity, and I also felt two consultants in one family was a lot. And <laughs> we wanted to have kids. So I joined um, one company called Signode Corporation and then quickly joined Tenneco Packaging. I spent 17 years at Tenneco. And Tenneco was a great place. It was a conglomerate. But in the packaging division, I had a mentor. And that's my other message, you know, international get a mentor, and I had a mentor who had three daughters, and he really wanted to advance women and give them opportunities if they so desired, and he gave me the chance to run businesses at 35 years old. And so I went in as running strategy and made acquisitions, and he said to me, let's see how good those acquisitions are um, when you run them. And I found, that's when I learned that, okay, the strategy is not easy, but it's a lot easier than motivating people and getting them to perform. And so I was running businesses where entrepreneurs, they were 50 years old, and I had made those acquisitions, and I had to motivate them, and we did a roll up, we built a packaging business for high tech, and I grew, and I managed bigger and bigger businesses for Tenneco, um, and spent a stint in Houston um, in a staff operations quality job, and really pushed to get back in the line, and that's my other piece of advice. If you wanna be, run a business, you know, insist on getting that line responsibility. Um, there's lots of opportunities to be, you know, I had people who said, don't you want to be head of strategy for Tenneco? And I said, no, I want to run a business because that's what really differentiates uh, people who are managing the bottom line. I'd had strategy opportunities, but pushing for running a business where you get a, you get a report card every month 
And that's what somebody said to me. So I've gotten a report card every month for the past uh, 25 years is uh, pretty sobering in terms of how you did. Even today, what's today, March 7th? Um, my, they're going to call me later today and tell me how we did in February. I mean, I think I know, but the books aren't quite closed. And you're just, you have to have that in your blood that you want to know, did, how did I do? How are we doing for the quarter? You know, are we on plan? So that, that's part of line management. Well, Tenneco ended up getting split up. And I was um, recruited to what was American National Can owned by Pechenet the French. And again, a very global company. Uh, very analytic. In fact, I was, we were talking earlier about the French. They're very, um, you know, very focused on who went to Polytechnique, who went to HSA, but a MIT was okay with them. <laughs> I don't. I'm not even sure Harvard would have been. Um, but again, my technology background. Again, the French are very analytic. We analyzed every one of our businesses. How are we going to grow them? And along the way, Pechenet was bought by Alcan, and this goes back to the story of. Acquisitions, you know, your, your companies, you're going to be bought and sold two or three times. And my advice to people is don't panic. The best people do well. So when Passion A was bought by Alcan in a hostile takeover, I remember the French called me up. It was July 4th. They were working. I was trying to take a holiday. And they said, Alcan's buying us. And they were afraid we're going to all lose our jobs. And I said, just keep your powder dry. They're a great company. They want good people. And three years later, I was asked to run all of Alcan Pechene packaging in Paris. And I was the one that was acquired, again, because they saw that I was very focused. I was focused on results, on strategy, and growing a business. And I ended up learning quite a bit from Alcan. Along the way, Alcan was bought by Rio Tinto as a white knight when Alcoa tried to buy Alcan. And again, I was, um, I was asked to run the Alcan packaging in Paris. And it was one of those career decisions where they gave me 24 hours to say, well, I move my whole family to Paris and run the $6.5 billion business. I actually turned it down. My husband was saying, oh, do it. You'll, you'll figure it out. And I said, no, I just, I'm, not, I'm not ready to make that commitment. So I turned it down. And about three days later, they called me back and said, you can commute for a year and figure it out with your family. And then we want you to move. And I said, OK, a year. I can figure that out. You know, I'll, I'll figure it out. And during that year, actually, Rio Tinto bought Alcan. They were going to sell the packaging business. I commuted for three years. I had a whole Paris life and paid taxes in an apartment. My family was in Chicago. But I was always on an airplane. I, I worked it out. And in the end, as I was selling the business for Rio Tinto, the Board of Corn Products called me up and said, how would you like to work in Chicago? And <laughs> you know, you keep your options open. So again, I think that my lessons learned is all about treating people well. I've had people who are really struggling in their jobs. And I know it, and they're not in the right job. And either I get them in the right job, or I actually counseled somebody out and gave them a package. He ended up being my customer at Nestle. And the fact that I had treated him right at the packaging company, he became my customer. He became a great customer. So, my, my advice to everybody is treat people well wherever you are, because they could be your customer at any point in time. And you want them to, to think highly of you. Secondly, um, get on the ground experience. You know, When I talk about international or operations, um, I still get a big thrill for every factory tour that I go on. And I went down to Brazil about a week ago, and we have an expansion. And I didn't just go to the Sao Paulo plant that was an hour or two away. We then got on a plane, and we went to the northeast, which is the fastest growing part of Brazil. It's a town called Recife. And it's like the Miami of Brazil. And we are expanding in a town called Cabo, because the brewer, Ambev, he's building, they're building breweries everywhere. And you know that in Brazil, there's going to be the World Cup and the Olympics. And so we make ingredients. So they were so thrilled that I came. Um, sometimes you go to a place, they want you to plant a tree. And you're supposed to come back and visit it. Um, and I've done that in India and other places. But it's all about you know, going to the plant. And I put on my hard hat and my white coat and my safety shoes and my earplugs. And it's all about meeting people and going out there. So that's part of, of the journey in my advice. Um, and respect cultural diversity. 
You know, um, my, even in my early days in London, um, I didn't want to be that loud American. So you temper your style. And even in France, you know, a lot of people say, oh, the French, they drive me crazy. I love them. I have a great way to finesse and work through strategies. And again, it's all about appreciating people's differences. So I have a very diverse board. On my board, I have 30% women, 20% minorities. I have a Mexican national. In fact, I joke, I only have four white American men. Um, but, it, but it's about diverse opinions. And my executive team is 50% women. So you really have to have um, appreciate different styles and different thoughts. And I want to understand how people are thinking about things differently. So I think that in, in summary, I give people a lot of advice. And uh, for what it's worth, you know, you're all in different stages of your career. You're getting an education. I tell all young women to get an MBA um, if they want a business career. Because you don't know 20 years from now, and so you're all doing this, if people are looking at two candidates, a man and a woman, and one has an MBA, the one with the, if you don't have the MBA, you're not going to get the job. So I even asked that today. Do they, do they have an MBA? Do they have a master's, an advanced degree? So you've done the right thing. Um, always understand the business. And that's, again, going in and meeting people and asking a lot of questions. Finding a mentor. And the mentor you need is going to change. I mean, I had a mentor for 10 years. And then he was going off into doing something else. So I found another mentor. So you, you're not going to have, you, you're not, you'll probably end up with two or three important mentors. My spouse has been an incredible mentor to me. I mean, he's a partner. He gives me advice. Um, my father was a mentor to me. You know, he was an accountant, and he used to bring home spreadsheets for me to fill in when I was 10 years old. <laughs> I mean, and he's, still, he's 89 years old now, and I remind him of that. And uh, he's actually gotten computer literate, too, so he's actually changed. Um, pursue international assignments at any point in your career. And we give, we give people what I call short-term assignments. They can't always move their family. So I'll say to somebody, gee, can you go to Hamburg and spend three months? We'll figure out you to come back a couple times. Can you go to China? Can you go to South America? And we move people around so they get those assignments. So when you get to the, your next job, tell people, I want some international experience, even if it's a short-term assignment. Um, get out of your comfort zone. So you know, I was a strategist, and then I was running businesses. Um, you know, living in Paris with my French was high school French. Again, going to a situation where you're not comfortable, you're going to learn an incredible amount, and you're not going to have the answers. And smart people will say, you know what, I'm going to figure it out. You know, I was in New York yesterday, and it was snowing. I figured it out how to get here today. So it's, it's again, you have to have that, have a plan. Be your own advocate. And I tell all men and women this, and especially women, um, when I was, you know, you have to go and ask for the assignment and ask and re-ask. So when I moved in Tenneco to that staff job in Houston where I was commuting and I really wanted to run a business, I used to go to the division presidents and I'd say, look, I want to get back to running a business. And I actually once went to one of our presidents and he was looking for somebody to run an automotive aftermarket business. And he said, um, I don't see you at Speedways on Saturdays. So I said, OK, I get it. And the next time he had a packaging job open, he gave it to me. Um, and finally, you know, seek a balanced life. There's going to be a lot of articles about balance. The word balance, I don't like. I, it's all about choices, how you spend your time. And again, I had a lot of nannies for my kids. I delegated a lot. I gave up sleep. I used to give my daughter spelling tests from the back of a taxi. It's all about you know, being organized and focused to get it done. And finally, um, it's all about going to people around you who can help you, you know, your family, your colleagues, your mentors, your teachers, your parents. You want them to be supportive. So surround yourself with supportive people. And people who aren't so supportive, so spend less time with them. So again, thank you very much for coming. And uh, I'm happy to open it up for questions. Do we have a mic with questions, and or should I? I think they're recording this, so be careful what you say. Good afternoon. Um, I was taking a look at your uh, annual report earlier, 
And uh, on your risk factors, risk factor number seven uh, discusses increasing concern among consumers, public health professionals about obesity. And it seems like um, from a profit standpoint, you're on the opposite side of a pretty important health debate. And uh, I was wondering if you could comment on that, if that's a debate you're trying to push or if you're hedging yeah. purely through other products. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, um, our uh, corn syrup for soft drinks is only 15, 14% of our business globally. So it's, a, it's not a large part, and we're actually only in five countries where we provide that type of product. But in today's world, it's all focused about what the consumers want, and there's lots of choices. So true, we have corn syrup, but at the same time, we make gluten-free products. We make prebiotics. We make, as I said, the physically modified starch for yogurt and for ready meals. So I think what's important is, is that you consumers, you offer a variety. So if you listen to Coca-Cola, to Mutar Kent, um, he'll say, look, there's many different consumers, and we want to offer the consumer choices. Even Michelle Obama, in her you know, Let's Move uh, campaign, says, look, People have to, it's all about choices and balance. And so we think it's important to offer consumers a lot of different choices, and we're, but we're growing in what I call healthy choices. Uh, next question. We have a brave group here. Okay, here's one in the middle. Hi. Uh, my name is Bjorn. I'm a Master of Finance student. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, it's a great story, but I wanted to ask you about the challenges and about the hurdles you've faced in your way. What would you say would, might be the one or two biggest challenges you faced in this journey? Um, you know, in my, in my career or in, my, or in the business? Career. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, I think it's... Um, I'm one of those people that is impatient, you know, and that, that's probably one of my tenacity and relentless, but I'm also impatient. And, and so in the career, you know, you are making lots of choices. So I'll give you an example. You know, I wanted to be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I think I said that to the press, I don't know, 20 years ago. And actually, um, you know, I ended up with a, a great opportunity in Chicago. But along the way, I could have been a CEO of a, of a large company earlier, but I would have had to move my family to St. Louis or to Atlanta. And so there were opportunities that came and choices that I decided it wasn't right for me and my family, and I wasn't willing to do that. And I didn't really want you know, the, the commute on a long-term basis because I really wanted um, you know, that whole kind of family, family experience. And so I'd say that that was one of the hurdles um, you have to make those choices. Today, the world is a lot more flexible, but if you're going to be CEO, you know, you have to make that commitment. So I'd say that that was a little bit of a frustration and was a hurdle that I only geographically wanted to be uh, in places that worked for my family, and that was large, major metropolitan cities. Um, I think other hurdles um, were on, um, you know, making the choices um, in the positions to really be recognized for what I was doing. And you know, as a young woman, you know, it's, it was a tough journey, uh, but I would just go in and be good at what I was doing. And the people around me were very supportive. I mean, you, know, you, you always had some people that maybe were undermining you, um, and you just had to, I ignored that. I mean, some of them I tried to win over, but otherwise I tended towards the ones that were supporters and just wanted to add a lot of value and be, be good, and you, but you do have to balance all that. And so I'd say, you know, it wasn't easy. Um, I always had a plan, and I wanted to run a bigger and bigger business, and again, get the global experience while raising a family and a husband that was always traveling. Um, but it, so it took a lot of juggling, but I thrive on that. Here's a question. Hi, this is Philip, uh, first MBA student. It appeared that you have dealt with a lot of rejection in your career, as I can see that you are reversing the trend and current. Do you have any advice on how to deal with the rejections? With rejection? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, gee, rejection makes us all stronger. Um, and I think, you know, and, and you know, it's interesting that you asked that question because I actually just did um, an interview um, for the New York Times on like leadership 
for their corner office section. And one of the things that I talked about is I look for people who have dealt with adversity. And, you know, very few people have perfect lives, whether it's in their career or their personal life. So the adversity is, it should make you stronger. And, you know, I'm sure I went home at night and said to my husband, you know, can you believe what this guy did to me? And he's not giving me the job. And, you know, why doesn't he think I could do it? But, you know, you, 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 know, you give yourself about 10 minutes of that. And then you say, you know what, I have a plan and I'm good and I'm going to make things happen. And so I think it comes from the strength that you have. But go back to the plan. Have a plan. You know, don't deviate from that. And you guys are all smart. And to be here at Sloan, you know, you have that, that ticket that, is, that means a lot in the rest of the world. I even put my ring on today from my MIT ring. Still fits. And uh, occasionally, if I know I'm going to an event, I put it on. Um, but it's, you know, you just got to say, I'm good and I can be successful. And the best thing about careers today, it's so broad and flexible. I mean, it used to be you went to one company in the corporate world. Today, people are entrepreneurs, the internet, global. Um, you know, Brazil, you know, it's so growing so rapidly. You know, the demand for engineers in Brazil is enormous and there aren't enough. Um, we have a lot of engineers in Colombia that were moving to Brazil. So again, um, smart people, a lot of opportunities. So ignore those people that are naysayers and just go back out there. Um, one, we have a cup full of time for one or two more. Hi, thanks for being here today. Um, the, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is the uh, production of corn ethanol is on the rise. Is that, some people raise the concern of using our resources for fuel instead of food. Is that a concern for Ingredion in any way? Well, Ingredion has chosen not to be in the ethanol business. And that was a decision made um, before me and that I've continued to reinforce because we're a food ingredient company. Now, it's true that the demand, the use of corn for ethanol has driven the price of corn up. And in fact, last year's drought which you all read about, certainly from the Midwest, um, you know, what has been, had had an enormous impact. In fact, a lot of the ethanol production shut down um, late this fall. It's starting back up and again because corn is coming down. Um, but it's, it's we, you know, we don't debate that. We just buy corn like everybody else. But I will tell you that if corn prices come down um, because of the supply-demand dynamics, you know, we pass it on to our food companies. So if corn prices come down and food prices come down, volume will go up and that's good for us. So, you know, we all prefer to feed the world with lower corn prices. Um, I don't know, you know, what will happen in the ethanol world, um, but obviously the ones that are not cost effective and at $8 corn, they're not gonna make any money, they're gonna lose money, and that's when they shut down. Um, but I can tell you there's a lot of moisture out there in the Midwest. You know, we got this snow a few days ago. So we're, uh, I never thought I'd care about, you know, the farming community in the Midwest, but, you know, t th this year we do. And I think people, that's why corn prices are coming down because there's so much moisture out there. But it, it's going to be a long-term debate and, you know, our government's going to have to make policies. Okay. Let me say thank you on all of our behalf, but please would you join me in thanking today's speaker.